Any other quick comments from the panel? Yeah, this is, <coughs> I don't think this is a big elephant because medicine is today is largely based on assessment of risk, not using genetics but using other tools. So conceptually it is not difficult and what genetics will do is, is simply give you numerical value to risk. That's all. And it's also extremely important to realize that medicine as it is practiced today is very poorly understood by the patients and, and it's only marginally understood by the physicians. So the ignorance there <laughs> is, is not anything new. You see, this, this, is, this, this isn't, when it comes to its very nature, fundamentally different. But genetics carries a different expectation of understanding, I think, by, by both doctors it, it, and by patients. It, it, it carries but, but, a different we'll go, we'll go expectation Francis, of understanding by audience like this, did but Francis not necessarily Collins, by patients. Did Francis Collins need to know, because of your test and your test, that he had an increased risk of type 2 diabetes to lose 25 pounds? Or should he just, I mean, you know, again, there, there's a, there's a, there, is a, there is an increased perception because of the, quote, precision, which is not as precise as we claim it to be, of the utilization of these tools and predicting outcomes um, that, that causes behavioral change. But that, but that precision doesn't have to come from genetics. That precision is coming from genetics because we have a failure to measure that precision in the rest of the measures that are meaningful you, in healthcare. You, you're, abs you're absolutely correct. And, and we have another so example the of the same. <laughs> with, 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 we are talking about a serious issue, don't laugh. <laughs> we, we, have, we, we have another example, we have a good example for some cholesterol, which in many ways, high, high elevated cholesterol has very similar implications as being uh, homozygous for the TCF7L2 variant. So, so this is nothing new. We have been working with this for years. Dietrich, 10 seconds on this? Yeah, I would agree that genetic information, I would agree with Kari that genetic information at its rawest form is just like an x-ray in terms of the pixels. It's just like a mass spec in terms of rolling all that data up for a physician and putting an asterisk next to it and telling them what they should do downstream of it. I would also agree, and we've seen this again across a, a, a base of hundreds of individuals, that the G word for some reason, and I don't know what it is, has a different impact on people and they do change behavior uh, more than, you know, their doctor sitting there screaming at them, telling them they're fat and they got to lose weight. So it's different. Okay. Two final questions. Yes. Okay. I'm on the open end, the open public end of the continuum. So could you just briefly comment on the social implications if my parents, my children, or my future grandchildren prefer to be at the secret, private end of the continuum? Is my consent potentially propagating out to people who would otherwise not be affected by my decisions? Yeah, familial, familial consent is, um, is certainly an issue. Um, right now, for the Personal Genome Project, uh, you're required to seek uh, familial consent only if you have a, um, a uh, monozygotic twin. But it's something that we're certainly looking at. I'm actually participating in another research project where I've actually been genotyped. And one of the things that I did was have an extensive conversation with my family about you know, what it would mean to publish this data in an identifiable fashion. And not everybody you know, at, first, you know, at first blush was really you know, on the same sort of side of the openness spectrum that I am. And so that's something that is going to be um, you know, a challenge as more and more people have access to this data and more and more people want to you know, make it open and available because what I want to do and my, you know, my ability to make that information available is going to come in conflict to a degree with you know, my siblings, my parents, my children. Um, you know, the good news is we're still dealing in probabilities and they diminish you know, very rapidly as you move away from, you know, from the individual. Yeah, I, Jamie? You know, um, I think we're going to be looking at that question in 20 years and laughing um, because I think it's over. I, I don't think there will be, I think the, you know, if you're thinking about the fact that every camera in five years will have a GPS and a transmitter to Amazon's cloud. And someone will be running facial recognition platforms on that. Um, when I, if I had an HIV test that I took over the counter and I got that diagnosis, I would go and type that into Google and they would know and they're a marketing company under no restrictions. And if I wanted to find it, I'd go type it into Yahoo Maps for the name of a clinic and they would know the address I was going to and they could impute it. So the idea that, I mean, we should just get used to now everything about ourselves our future, our past, and our ability to modify that will be computed and known in 20 years, and it's just done. And everything else is just time. And you can choose when you want to go over that cliff. Final question is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Final question is from Mike Cariasso. Mike. Hi, uh, Mike Cariasso from Snipedia. I'm a little concerned, actually. I keep hearing this 
sort of mantra of reporting back probabilities, and I really think that it's an artifact of the way that GWAS work and the fact we're working on microarrays that we're forced to impute so much and we're forced to rely on probabilities. But it, I really don't want to imagine that's the end game we're looking for, and I'm a little surprised that so many of you seem to be looking towards the day where you're communicating probabilities back rather than we've now found the causative mutation. That's, in fact, what you want to be doing. Probabilities are the information you look to return to users in the, the near term. This is a fundamental misunderstanding yeah. because what these sequence variants that confer the risk of common diseases do is in many instances just to put you on a normal distribution curve of physiologic function. And so when you're exposed to a certain environment that pushes you farther along that curve, you will develop the disease. The, the kind of mutations you are talking about are simply the Mendelian mutations and the coating sequences, the rare diseases. They are not the diseases that cause, that are responsible for most of the public health burden in our society. So this is, this is a mistake. And there are know. not causative <coughs> mutations in these diseases, only in the Mendelian, Mendelian phenocopies of them. And even there, there's often a fluff factor yep. associated yeah. called penetrance, which means you might not get it, and we have no idea why. Well, I, uh, actually, <laughs> let's do it the simple way, by the way. It's not about the genome. You know, what, what, what city do you live in? Lockeninga, the Netherlands? In the Netherlands. Okay, so your probability of being hit by a bus, which is probably your most likely cause of death given your age and status right now, is driven by whether you live in a city or not. And it is, I can't tell you whether you're getting hit by a bus or not, but I can tell you whether you're more or less likely to based on whether you live on Carr's Farm or <coughs> down in the middle of New York City. Are you saying that he, he would be hit by a volcano? <laughs> <laughs> you already tried to get me, actually, That's on the way over here. There's a very good chance of that, I think. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please thank the panel for a fantastic discussion. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>